Hello aviators, Sky here, and the summer of air shows has begun. I am usually talking about foreign events, sitting in some cozy room, but this time I decided that the news from the field would be more interesting. Welcome to Le Berger. The Paris Air Show is huge, a lot of large pavilions and of course the exhibited equipment, the number of which tends to infinity. Nearly two and a half thousand participants, about 140 airplanes and helicopters, more than 300,000 visitors and almost half a million entries. Apparently there was a lot of psychos like me hanging out here for several days. France is France, so the first thing we see in the parking lot is the brainchild of the Fifth Republic aircraft industry. The Ministry of Defense graciously provided the crowd with several Rafales, equipped and surrounded by all kinds of weapons they could find. We'll get to those planes later in separate videos, but for now, yeah, beauty, beauty. A bit expensive of course, but what can we do? Nearby, surrounded by air defense systems, stands the Airbus helicopter's Tiger, which in French sounds like Le Tigre, in my opinion even cooler. Unfortunately, there is nothing to compare it with. There are no more attack helicopters around, no Russian ones at all, and the only American stands in a distance, surrounded by planes of its own company. We'll see it later. But across the road, there is a military modification of the new Airbus H-160M. Camouflage coloring, a lot of additional military systems, and of course, machine guns. This helicopter is not yet a serious model, and time will show its effectiveness, but this is the H-160, and the H-160 is awesome. A fresh, handsome Airbus helicopter full of a whole bunch of cool innovations. Here, surrounded by helicopters and turboprops, is another interesting specimen. Under the tent stands one of the promising Bell models, however in the form of a mock-up. The model 525 Relentless, which in the market of the medium-sized helicopters should compete with the Italian Augusta Westland 139, took off in 2015, but is still being tested. According to the representatives of the company, prototypes have flown more than 1000 hours, but the testing process continues to achieve maximum quality of serious production machines. Meanwhile, the delivery dates haven't been revealed yet. Even the first modification is not clear, whether it is an offshore option for the sea or a VIP version. And for now, Leonardo continues to look down on everyone. The 139 is in fact one of its kind. Of course, where there is France, there is beauty. Where there is beauty, there is aviation. And where there is the beautiful French aviation, there are the Falcons. It would be strange if the Sioux had not rolled out all the business jets that were available. The 2000S, 900LX, 8X, the cabin mock-up of the future 6X, cool. And while the Dassault combat aircraft are beautiful, but expensive and not very popular, their business jets are beautiful, expensive and very popular. I'll be sure to look at them in the future and answer the main riddle of the French soul. A three-engine scheme on the business jet in the 21st century. The main military news of the show was probably the premiere of the new generation fighter jets. Of course they are made of plastic, but who knows, something may come out of it. The future combat air system, or the FCAS program, shines brightest of all. France this time has united with Germany and plans to create its own fighter of a new generation. The project was announced last year, when Dassault and Airbus signed a cooperation agreement, which they have now expanded. Here however it is worth mentioning that for now the project is at the stage of consideration of concepts. The mock-up that was presented at Le Berger is quite general, without much detail. It is a twin-engine fighter made in accordance with the requirements of the modern stealth concept, so it looks like the Raptor or the F-35. However, it has a different wing design, a kind of trapezoid with swept wing consoles. The tail is represented by large, separated fins. In the back of the mock-ups, round nozzles are applied. The flat ones, like on the F-22, are not very popular. Although, as an innovation, the nozzles were equipped with chevrons, something similar to the teeth on the new Boeing engines. The fighter is supposed to be made in a manned and unmanned versions and put in the middle of a group of drones, called remote carriers. I must say, these are only concepts, not a fact that in the end we will see something like that. The Europeans call it almost the sixth generation, but for now these are just words, we'll just have to wait and see. The implementation of the program is planned for 2040, 
a long time, but it is traditional. The fourth generation, putting it mildly, was not made quickly too. The description of the aircraft and its appearance obviously resemble another European concept. The British Tempest is like a twin brother to it. The point here is that initially the FCAS project was the DSU and BAE systems collaboration, so it can be assumed that both aircraft have common conceptual roots. The DSU is now with Airbus. Spain joined the project. Other aviators are showing interest. MBDA, Thales and Cefran are also here. There is still hope that the British nevertheless will take part. After all, such programs are very expensive. How it will be implemented, time will tell. Europeans are good at aviation, but we need patience. For now, the newest device in this niche remains the Lockheed Martin product. The Americans estimate that until the FCAS and Tempest fighters appear in the end of the 2030s, the Europeans will need about 500 new combat aircraft, and they want those to be the F-35. However, they shouldn't really count on the French and the Germans. The French Air Force has the Rafale, so they are not particularly interested in the F-35. And the large Luftwaffe military tender suggests replacing the Agent Tornado with either the Eurofighter Typhoon or the FA-18EF Super Hornet. But beside them, there are many other countries that want this jet, but so far they don't rush into Lockheed's arms, because of the difficulties with the planes, their cost and internal issues. How many of those do they need? Problems of course are gradually being solved, but the announced plans for 500 planes seem overly ambitious. This figure is achievable probably if the F-35 wins all European tenders. In addition, one of the largest customers, Turkey, may fall out of the program completely. The Turks, by the way, do not waste time and present their own fifth generation fighter. Also a mock-up, of course. Turkish aerospace industries roll out the TFX, which they have been making since the early 2010s. Initially, the aircraft was created as a lightweight fighter to replace the F-16, but now its roles may begin to expand. Externally, it is a classic fifth-generation fighter, constructively almost a copy of the F-22. So it is sometimes called the Cheap Raptor. A very promising subject on the world market, by the way, if they can pull it off. BAE Systems and Rolls-Royce are helping. It is planned to use the EJ-200 modification from the Eurofighter Typhoon as a fiery heart. Nozzles, once again with a round section and chevrons. A new Paris fashion trend. Plus, the Russian Rostech is showing interest in the program. For now it's just a statement, but the United Aircraft Corporation may also play its part, one way or another. The actual aircraft, according to the Thai plans, should appear by the mid-2020s. Very ambitious. Over the light airplanes and fighters, the transports are towering. The A400M and its Japanese jet brother, Kawasaki C2, the Asian exotic. The first thought? Huh, a twin-engine C17. But it is a wrong thought. In general, not many people know about it, but there is something to see. Born to replace the old C-1 from the 1970s, it is equipped with a pair of GE CF-6. Yes, not the newest engines in the world, but it can carry up to 36 tons or 81,000 pounds of cargo. In this regard, it is almost a direct competitor to the A400M, the Airbus military transport plane. The aircraft made its maiden flight in 2010 and is now being delivered to the Japanese Self-Defense Air Force, with the potential for export to several other interested countries. It is not going to conquer the world, of course, but nevertheless, there it is, alive and real. Mitsubishi presented at the air show their MRJ airliner, which was rebranded and is now called the Spacejet M100. In Paris, Mitsubishi signed an agreement of intent with a promising North American company to purchase 15 aircraft by 2024. For now, that is all. They already have orders for a couple of hundred planes, so the customers are just waiting for this miracle to finally start operations. However, against the background of conversations and expectations of this long-realized project, few people have noticed the no less significant events. The fact is that the Japanese want to buy the CRJ program. Yes, Canadian regional jet from Bombardier. Apparently, the Canadian company decided to get rid of the assets in the field of commercial aviation and continue developing only its business jet line. C-Series turned into the A220, CRJ will turn into the JRJ or something like that, 
and the Q-series turboprops are going to Viking Air, another Canadian aircraft manufacturer, which, by the way, at Le Berger, received orders for the good old DHC-6 Twin Otter, CL-515 amphibian firefighters, and several Q-400 airliners. The Japanese apparently decided to return to the aviation industry seriously. It is not yet clear how they will be forming their line, but at least their competences and service network may turn out quite good. A couple of Swiss are passing us by. The good old PC-12 and the new one, PC-24 Jet, which will complement its turboprop brother. Both planes, by the way, promise to attend at MAX, the Moscow Air Show, in August, so we will have a chance to meet them closer. Brazil threw a couple of their own bombs into the flame of this aviation party. First of all, of course, the Embraer E-195, the big brother in the new E-2 generation, traditionally wearing an elegant coat, this time kind of a cyberpunk line with the signature Profit Hunter. The hunt can be considered successful, an order for 37 planes plus another 41 aircraft of the little E-175 model. The main customers are KLM and United Airlines. The business division was introduced by the brand new Praetor 600, the little brother of the legacy model. Praetor accommodates 12 people and flies almost 7,500 kilometers, or 4,000 miles. Catalog cost $21,999.99. Embraer has a cause for celebration at this air show. It turns 50 years old. Therefore, they put these things all over the place. So yeah, they're the same age as Airbus, it's a straight up double birthday. Another cool guest from Embraer was the KC-390 military transport, a curious plane created quite recently and only just starting its journey, and this journey will be full of adventures and difficulties. I'll go a little ahead and say that here, on the static parking, there is a couple of already quite familiar aircraft, the C-130 Hercules in the H and J versions. The fact is that even though these planes are cute, looking at each other from different sides of the airfield, now they are actually big and sharp-toothed enemies. Confrontation of manufacturers, airplanes and even the concepts. The C-130 is a classic military transport aircraft. A straight wing, four turboprop engines, a powerful landing gear. It has already proven itself a million times, has many modifications, is very flexible in operations, reliable and knows how to pull its masters out of trouble. At the Farnborough show last year, its civilian version, LM100, was performing loops as a demonstration of maneuverability. The capabilities of the aircraft made it Lockheed Martin's pride and a very important model. The C-130 is the Boeing 737 in the world of military transport aviation. Almost one-fifth of the aircraft in this class are the C-130. More than two and a half thousand planes, and the Americans are not planning to give up. On the other hand, we have the KC-390, that yearns to get into the same industry, but through the different door, with a completely different concept. The Brazilians are saying, yes, straight-wing turboprop engines and the classic design are good, but your plane is already old. Come on, it's from the mid-1950s. Besides, four engines and a bunch of old components are expensive, and the straight-wing turboprop is slow, only 400 miles per hour, and this is 2019. The KC-390 is equipped with a swept wing and a pair of turbofan engines, flies faster and higher. A lot of new systems and engineering solutions make it more efficient. Yes, at minimum speeds when flying from the mountain soil in the middle of nowhere, it may be inferior to the C-130. But for the rest, it is superior. And in the missions for the transport of troops and equipment over medium distances, it is far superior. There are many disputes on these topics. Embraer said that even with the swept wing, due to mechanization, the plane's minimum speed and maneuverability are excellent, and a pair of jet engines is cheap, reliable, and provides high speeds. Lockheed, however, points out that the average military transport is first of all a tactical tool, not an airliner, so there is not much use for a high cruise speed. Besides, how reliable can the engine be if, for example, someone is shooting at it? The 130 has four of them, it's more reliable either way. Conceptually, by the way, this couple looks like a couple of C2 and A400M. One is a twin-engine jet, and the other is a four-engine turboprop except the Japanese and European planes are larger and they are both new. 
The judges, as always, will be time and demand of the military. Here Lockheed is in a good position. The army knows and loves the C-130. Although I will add that in the KC-390 project, Embraer has been working with Boeing for a long time, and they can provide good help. Besides, there is nothing more pleasant than to spoil the fun for a competitor at home. Next, the F-15 and Apache are standing on the concrete, and near them they promised to put the F-35. But it's gone, and the soldiers standing here are just shrugging their shoulders, not knowing where it is. I can guess that since the F-15 and Apache are Boeing, they just kicked out the Lockheed plane. The witnesses are silent. Across the street are the P-8 Poseidon Marine Patrol, the new KC-46 aerial tanker, and the classic CH-47 Chinook helicopter. They are all silent, and all of them are also Boeing. Although, there is one more theory. Some people are saying that the F-35 actually was standing there. We just couldn't see it because, well, it is a new generation stealth fighter, isn't it? By the way, the main KC-46 competitor also stands nearby. The European Airbus A330 MRTT aerial tanker of the French Air Force. Beautiful and dismissively turns to the 46 with its tail. It's funny how they put these opponents next to each other, like it's some kind of Eurovision. By the way, the ATR performed here pretty well. Their ATR-42-600 and 72-600 turboprops scored orders for as many as 145 aircraft. Although they are mostly memorandums and options, still not bad at all, given the rather modest demand for turboprop regional planes nowadays. Apparently the cool pink color somehow has a positive effect on Asian customers. Most of the portfolio came from the Indonesian Nusantara Air Charter. Across from the pink ATR, in the middle of the static parking, stand our old marathon friends, the Gulfstream business jets that are so proudful here that they are all turned towards the main exhibition with their tails. The team is cool, the G550 and G650ER and the younger G280 is standing nearby. The local premiere was the big one from the pair of newcomers, the Gulfstream G600. Its certification should be completed by mid-summer, and then its deliveries to the customers will finally begin. The Russian flag is not widespread in Le Berger, but it is still here. Of the large aircraft, the Be-200ES as well as a pair of Ansat helicopters were demonstrated, one in the medical version and the other with a VIP cabin. Very nice, besides, they all got to fly here. The rest of the stands were scattered mainly in the pavilions and chalets of the airshow, showing mock-ups and parts of Russian equipment. The largest one, of course, was the stand of the United Aircraft Corporation. Here in general a rather classic airshow set. For now there's just a bunch of mock-ups. But it's okay, these guys are gonna have their fun at MAX 2019. The main UAC exhibit was of course the MC-21, the new Russian single-aisle airliner. There is no real aircraft here, just a little model, but they did bring a flight simulator that allows to form some idea of the cockpit. But only some idea. The complex is more of a demonstration prototype, so not everything is exactly the same as on the real machine. The layout is quite classic for modern commercial airliners. Big displays, modern design and side sticks. The cockpit glazing is pretty large, so I'm sure that enjoying the view will be very comfortable. For pilots, of course. We will continue looking through the windows. Again, Moscow Air Show. There we will see the MC-21 as a whole, and it will be glorious. Hmm, the story turns out to be very long. I think it will be better to divide the video in two. So soon there will be the second part, in which we will see the final battle of the main aviation kaiju, summarize the air show, as well as take a walk through the Le Berger Aviation Museum. There is something to look at. In the meantime guys, let's take a break. Like the video and subscribe to the channel not to miss the sequel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.